since we are talking about IP legislations, what needs to be pointed out is that apart from the Patents Act which contains an express provision that prevents uh, imposition of restrictive covenants or anti-competitive agreements on third parties, there is no legislation apart from the Patents Act which contains a similar counterpart and this is indeed surprising considering that TRIPS flexibilities permits India to incorporate similar provisions within each and every IP legislation as a safeguard to prevent abuse of intellectual property. Now section 140 of the Patents Act itself has a historical basis and it takes its origins or it takes its source or it, it sources itself from section or from article 40 of the TRIPS which again deals with the aspect of restrictive covenants. Uh, the question that now arises is, in the event of uh, a license to a patent containing a restrictive covenant within the meaning of section 140 of the Patents Act, which would be the, the, the appropriate authority or the competent authority to take cognizance of that and to take appropriate action? Under the Patents Act, there are three provisions which make references to anti-competitive practices. One would be section 84, the other would be section 140 and the other would be section 90, 90, section 90. In all the three provisions, there is a reference to anti-competitive practice, but there is absolutely no clarity on which authority shall declare or adjudge this particular, a particular practice as an anti-competitive practice. Importantly, there is no clarification or an express provision in the Patents Act which declares that the controller of patents shall have the right to adjudicate on these issues or that there is an exclusion of the applicability of the Competition Act insofar as these provisions are concerned. And since there is no similar exclusion of Patents Act from the Competition Act, one could come to the legitimate conclusion that insofar as anti-competitive practices of a patentee is concerned, it shall be the Competition Act and therefore the Competition Commission that shall continue to exercise jurisdiction as far as the practice is concerned. Now this is important because there is an ongoing uh, debate on conflict of jurisdiction or conflict of powers between the controller of patents and the uh, Competition Commission. It must be understood that as far as the co controller of patents is concerned, he is not a market regulator. He, his role is limited to ensuring that the patentee adheres to the obligations that are imposed on him under the Patents Act and that he fulfills all his obligations. It is true that under section 83F, one of the obligations is to prevent any kind of abuse of the patent right that is granted to a patentee. However, the mechanism for that uh, is not compulsory license because all that a compulsory license does is to create an interest in the favor of a, of a person interested but does not in any way create a punitive deterrence for a patentee or against a patentee to prevent future abuse of the patent uh, future abuse of the patent right why is this important it cannot be anybody's case that the only consequence of the abuse of a patent right shall be the grant of a compulsory license and there can be no other punitive consequence or award against the patentee. The consequence of such a proposition would be that abuse of patents and the exercise of patent rights as a whole would be completely outside the purview of the Competition Act, which does not seem to be the intent of the legislature given the breadth of section 194G of the Competition Act, which does not exclude the Patents Act. Similarly, when there is an express reference to intellectual property rights in section 3, one can fairly assume and logically infer that intellectual property rights despite uh, local remedies that have been provided for under IP legislations continue to be within the ambit of the Competition Act the moment they enter their realm of anti-competitive agreements or abuse of dominance. Simply stated, the moment an intellectual property right is exercised in a way that it amounts to an anti-competitive practice or amounts to abuse of dominance under section 3 and 4 or 3 or 4 respectively, it is the Competition Act that shall exercise jurisdiction over that conduct and not the controller of patents or the registrar of copyrights or the registrar of trademarks. Since none of these uh, registrars 
uh, or controllers have the power, expertise or wherewithal to deal with the aspect of market consequences of the abuse of intellectual property. Apart from uh, the uh, interplay between IP legislations uh, and intellectual property, the other aspect that has come to fore in the recent uh, uh, years, at least in the last five years, is the anti-competitive implications or antitrust implications of exercise of standard essential patents or enforcement of standard essential patents. Standard essential patents, as the name explains, refers to a breed of patents where uh, compliance to a standard is absolutely essential and the patent claims that particular standard. In other words, there is no non-infringing alternative to the patent if a third party wishes to comply with the technology standard. For instance, the GSM technology in the arena of telecommunications has a host of standards and it has a whole bunch of patents, in fact close to 30 to 40,000 patents which claim each of these technology standards and each of these patents are held by multiple entities. In other words, there are at least five or six major players who have distributed among themselves or, or who hold among themselves a host of 30 to 40,000 patents. The question that this kind of litigation or this kind of holding poses for antitrust jurisprudence is this. Since the holding of a standard essential patent or, a, or the holding of a host of standard essential patent lends a position of dominance to the patent owner, are there obligations on the patentee or under the competition regime apart from obligations under the Patents Act? The answer is a straightforward yes. This is because again, standard essential patent although may be a breed that may be referred to in the realm of commerce is not something that is specifically recognized under the Indian Patents Act. The Indian Patents Act strikes no distinction between patents and standard essential patents. Therefore, all obligations under all legislations that apply to a normal patent equally apply with equal vigor to standard essential patents. Therefore, the proscription uh, of abuse of a patent right under section 4 of the Competition Act read with section 194G of the Competition Act applies equally to a standard essential patent and in fact even more considering that a position of dominance is better acquired in the case of the ownership of a standard essential patent compared to a normal patent. Now what are the consequences or what are the aspects of the enforcement of a standard essential patent that have antitrust implications? The first is the manner in which uh, a standard essential patent is expected to conduct uh, in order to ensure uh, the fair adoption of the standard by all third parties and fair and reasonable access to the technology standard to all third parties. Here it must be pointed out that each of these technology standards are formulated through a consensual mechanism uh, by standard setting organizations. So for instance in the arena of telecommunications it is the European Technology Standards Institute which is one of the major standard setting organizations whose standards are recognized across Europe and, and in India by the Department of Telecommunications when it comes to the GSM technology. The point that is to be understood is standard setting organizations limit themselves to setting standards and limit themselves to seeking declarations from uh, their members that if their patents are declared as standard essential patents then FRAND obligations that is fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory obligations will apply to each of their members and to each of the standard essential patent, patentees. However, standard setting organizations do not take upon themselves the duty or the obligation of spelling out what would a FRAND obligation translate to practically with respect to each and every patent held by their members. In other words, price setting or formulation of a methodology is not something that is undertaken by standard setting organizations. Then who undertakes this process or who undertakes this exercise? There are two aspects of the issue. One is price setting or the actual royalty setting and the second is curbing those aspects which go beyond royalty setting uh, but which still amount to abuse of dominance. Insofar as the broad conduct of a standard essential patentee is concerned, 
it is outside the purview of a controller of patents simply because the controller of patents has only one mechanism namely the compulsory licensing mechanism which restricts itself to three conditions or three circumstances in which the mechanism may be invoked. However, the nature of the competition commission, the scope of the issues that it is capable of addressing, the width of the powers that it has been vested with by the legislature, legislature more or less uh, give rise to the conclusion, a firmly uh, reasonable conclusion and a firmly irrefutable conclusion that the competition commission is not only better placed but is also probably the sole authority or the sole forum which has the power to deal with aspects of abuse since they cannot be dealt with legally by the controller of patents.